Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so delighted to have you here. Um, this will be a record-breaking webinar for NERC in terms of attendance. Uh, so that is great news, and that's, of course, all due to you. Uh, I am the Executive Director of the Northeast Recycling Council, NERC. And before we really get started, I'd like to thank our generous sponsors who help make these possible webinars, uh, Advanced Drainage Systems, uh, who makes plastic drainage pipes from uh, post-consumer HDPE, history and revolution. So thank you very much. This webinar is being recorded. You will get access to the recording. It will be on the NERC website along with the presentations and handouts. Now, you may notice that there's three handouts available that you can download right now if you want. I mean, they'll be available throughout the webinar, but they too will be on the NERC homepage by tomorrow. You will get an email that reminds you of this in 24 hours. So that you don't have to ask about that. Yes and yes. Um, you, are gonna, you are muted, you will stay muted, but we really want your questions. So the way you're gonna do that is to use the question box. So if you're familiar with the GoToWebinar platform, you know where it is. But if you're not, either you see a dashboard open on your screen and you look down through it and there's a gray bar that says questions and you click the little white arrow, it opens up and you type it in and hit send. Um, or if that's not there, you've got a little orange arrow. You click that and that opens up the dashboard. So that's where we're gonna be seeing your questions. We're gonna hear from all of our uh, panelists are gonna start with very brief presentations and then uh, we're gonna have a conversation and lead into your questions and, um, and answer session. Um, we have a, a moderator who is Chaz Miller and five wonderful panelists today. So uh, I'd like to get going with the bios uh, and then we'll turn to the content. As I noted, our moderator is Chaz Miller. His career in waste and recycling has spanned four decades with stints at the US EPA Office of Solid Waste and the agency original, original recycling programs, the Glass Packaging Institute and the National Waste and Recycling Association. He is a member of the Maryland Recycling Network Board and an ex officio of the NERC Board of Directors. Although now retired from full-time work, he consults and continues to write his circular file column for Waste 360 and to speak at waste and recycling conferences. He chaired the Montgomery County Aiming for Zero Waste Task Force as it advised the county on its 2020 solid waste plan update. And this last, well, last year, 2020, he won the National Recycling Coalition's Lifetime Achievement Award. Our first presenter is gonna be Tanya Randell. She's a program manager for No Longer More Recycling. They changed their name, they're now Stina a consulting and research firm with nearly 20 years of exper expertise in plastic packaging recycling. She supports work on plastic packaging recyclability and is the principal consumer liaison on film and other plastic recycling, recycling questions. Tanya received a bachelor's degree in environmental science and policy from Duke University. And she serves as the president of the board of directors for the Carolin, Carolina Recycling Association. Next, we'll be hearing from Sandy Childs. She is the Director of Film and Flexible Programs for APR, the Association of Plastic Recyclers. Sandy manages APR's Film Reclamation Committee and its contributions to APR's Design Guide for Plastics Recyclability and PE Film Test Protocols. Prior to APR, Sandy served as a Recovery Development Manager for Coca-Cola Recycling creating models for brand owner investments in the recycling value chain and starting recycling programs at NASCAR racetracks. Sandy started her career in recycling PET plastics as a recycling manager for Southeastern Container and then as Eastern Regional Director for NAPCOR. She has a BS in human ecology from Ramapo College of New Jersey and a master's in environmental science from UNC Chapel Hill. Getting a lot of Carolina people here. Sherry Jackson, is the Director of Film Recycling Plastics Division of the American Chemistry Council. She oversees the development, implementation, and promotion of national and local programs designed to generate strong growth in the recycling of polyethylene film packaging. As the Director of ACC's Flexible Film Recycling Groups, she leads programs and partnerships with key stakeholders that increase public awareness about how, where, and the importance of recycling film packaging while facilitating broader engagement. She has a BA in journalism from Ohio State University. Aideen Quinn has been working in the recycling industry for nearly a decade. 
She spent the first eight years working at MRFs, including Sims in New York City and Canada Fibers in Toronto, and has been working with EFS Plastics for two years. She is the Director of Business Development and Procurement at EFS. Aideen has an undergraduate and graduate degrees in biology from McGill University and the University of Toronto, and she is currently pursuing a part-time MBA degree at York University in Toronto. And certainly not least, but yes, last, Cherish Miller is the Vice President, Sustainability and Public Affairs at Revolution. She has worked in packaging for over 24 years in marketing, sustainability, and product development. She has a BA in marketing and an MBA in finance from Cal State University Fullerton. Currently, she is on the executive committee of the Sustainable Packaging Coalition, a board member of APR's Foundation for Plastic Recycling, a board member of Western Plastics Association, and is part of several committees and associations focused on collaborative solutions to circularity. So this is a really exciting panel. Um, with that, I am going to uh, ask Chaz to uh, give us some introductions and I'm gonna make Tanya a presenter so that when Chaz is done, Tanya will be able to show her slides. So thanks everybody. And remember to post your questions in the question box. Uh, thank you, Lynn, and uh, thank you to all the panelists and to all the audience who are here today. This is an extraordinary number of people uh, signed up for this this webinar. Uh, I'm just going to start off with with Tanya. Uh, get the presentations rolling, and then we will get uh, over to uh, questions and answers. So, Tanya, take it away. Thanks, Chaz. Uh, you guys can see my screen, right? Yes. All right, so this was a really exciting day for us. Um, the uh, Yesterday we launched Astina Inc., which is our actual incorporated name. We are still more recycling at heart, so nothing has really changed other than our name, so it's really great to be here. Um, so I was asked to kind of give us a, a little bit of an overview about what we're talking about related to film, and then I'm gonna go a little bit into the drop-off directory and some of the challenges therein. So what are we talking about today? For our purposes, we're gonna focus on polyethylene film. And there are examples on the right, grocery bags, newspaper bags, um, case wraps, pallet and stretch wraps, LO, uh, air pillows, bubble wrap, et cetera. So that's what we're talking about today. And it's really the only type of film with robust markets in the U.S. at the moment. And that includes the material that you can take back to the grocery store for recycling. Film can also be made out of things like PET and other resins, and it can also be multi-layered. It can also have a metalized layer to it. But those are not readily recyclable at the moment. And both APR and ISRI have specifications available, which are real guidelines about um, the quality and the, and the kind of material that goes in a bale coming out of a, either commercial generated or some other collection program. And so, you know, there's lots of things available related to film, but all of them are really focusing on polyethylene at the moment. And so some of the trends that we have, um, our company has done the annual plastics recycling survey for about the last 10 years. And so we collect data about material uh, that's plastic that's been collected for recycling. And both commercial film, i.e. the grade A clear films, as well as the PE retail bag and film categories have seen growth in the last couple of years. The rest of them have seen declines or have kind of stayed flat. And the chart on the right is a, just kind of an example of the data that we collect. And this is um, PE retail bag and film collected for the US and Canada in millions of pounds since 2015. Um, 2018 is the latest data point that we have. The 2019 report is in kind of final stages of drafting and details uh, are forthcoming. So those you know, should be out shortly, but 2018 is the latest. And so you can just see that we see an upward growth in the material that's being collected at grocery stores and being recycled. We're also seeing a considerable growth in film use because it's a lightweight, which you know ultimately reduces film consumption for the product package, but also it's waterproof and durable. So it's a really, it's really good at what it does. It's highly efficient, but equally important to making sure that the supply is protected and the material being collected is not contaminated. There's really a need for more reclamation capacity and in markets. And I think Adine and, and Cherish can both speak to the in market need, including use back into film packaging and bags. And so just here's some of the data that I was talking about. Again, 2018 is the latest data available. But you can see both PE Clear, which is at the top, and PE Retail Bags are in the middle, had a little bit of a growth from 2017 to 2018. The rest of those, colored film, ag film, curbside film, and then other films that are not necessarily in any of these other categories, 
but still polyethylene, um, you know, all had declined. So it was really flat 2017 to 2018. And then the, the final column on the right means consumed by U.S. and Canadian reclaimers, meaning it was used here in North America, in Canada and the U.S. to be made into something else, whether it be pellet or another product. The remainder of that material would have been exported or, um, you know, sent somewhere else for, for processing. And so, you know, going back to in markets and recycled content, getting the circularity and really closing the loop on things really requires lots of players along the way. And so all of the value chain are really needed, you know, both converters and brands that are making packages, retailers that are collecting it, consumers that are buying those packages, but you also then have to, re you know, recycle it again. And then there's reclaimers, you know, that are turning it into a resin or something that could be used and being brought back into the, into the um, process. And so, for example, with the boxes, retailers are both sellers and users. So, you know, they're also, they're selling packages or products with their private label that are made in, you know, they're packaged in film, but they're also collecting it and putting it back into the process. <clears throat> and design for recycling matters. And I think uh, Sandy's going to probably touch on this a little bit, but APR guidance about what it means to make a package that's recyclable is really critical here. We want to make sure that what's going in the bin actually can be recycled. And then the flip side of that is using recycled content and pulling that back into things like garbage bags or packaging or consumer bags as well. And that really helps stimulate the demand for bailed post-consumer film. And so then, you know, my, my key point that I'm going to talk about is related to the drop-off directory. This is my kind of focus area is um, it's, a, it's a resource that we manage at Stina and, you know, the how to recycle label, social media, articles, brands, all sorts of consumer campaigns really drive consumers to their directory, which is housed on plasticfilmrecycling.org, then that ultimately leads them to a store that has a drop-off bin. A lot of consumers still don't know that this material is, is recyclable. And you can see on the graph at the bottom, the orange line is um, 2018 to 2019 data points. And then the blue line is a, a year later, and there, we were actively in a campaign in Seattle about taking the material back to the store because Seattle was gonna take it out of their curbside collection. And you can see this real increase across a three month period from October to the middle of January, year over year, the blue line saw considerable growth because there was a lot of social media, there was a lot of push, there were articles and, and um, you know, educational outreach to, to drive consumers back to the store and it really works. And overall contamination is really low when consumers are educated about what goes in the bin. So we've done some bag audits and, and looked at what happens when you tell consumers to take the material back and we see that there's a lot more of the right stuff and a lot less of the wrong stuff going in the bin. And they really are actively looking for places to recycle film. This is a quote that I got, please give me one location in central Massachusetts where I can recycle plastic bags as of October 2020. Middle of the pandemic, someone was really trying to find a location that actually had a bin. We were able to solve it um, with some outreach to Massachusetts DEP and some of their local staff, but we found a location that this gentleman could actually recycle. But then the challenges are, is a lot of times chains don't understand the value of that take back program to consumers and they often pull the bin, whether it's related to the pandemic or not, and they really don't understand the service that they really provide. And then market conditions, bag policies like the one we've seen in California and the pandemic have all impacted drop offs, uh, the network in the last several years, and, and they've impacted it in different ways. And it's still confusing to consumers. What is and what isn't accepted is consuming, you know, there's a, the issue with lookalikes just because one product or format is recyclable doesn't mean one that looks exactly like it is because you know there's technical recyclability and there's a process in place and so there can be some real confusion about what goes in the bin and what doesn't and then really you know the funding needed to cover the cost to maintain the listings and answer questions about what is acceptable you know we're really at risk of not being able to, to keep this going because we really need some financing and some support through sponsorships for the drop-off directory and you can see on the right hand just the kind of growth that we've seen just over the last three years and the number of users and page views you know driven by a lot of the outreach and support so um that's kind of my piece you know so if you're interested in more information about the drop-off directory especially if you're interested in sponsoring it here's my email and i think we're going to take questions at the end so i'm on to sandy Thank you, Tanya. That was that was an excellent introduction to to this to this subject. And yes, we will be taking questions at the end. Uh, but uh, I don't see any questions yet, so if people have them. Feel oh, free. there's a lot of there's a lot of questions, Chaz. They're not so, showing up on my screen. Hmm. Well, there's a lot. That's good. Cool. Not a complaint. Uh, our next speaker is Sandy Child. Sandy.
Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, good, good. All right, well, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Um, it's really exciting to see so many people um, logging into this webinar uh, with an interest in film and flexibles. It's a big topic, um, which is why we have um, so many people looking at different aspects of it. So I'll just dive in from the APR perspective. Uh, APR is the Association of Plastic Recyclers. We are the voice of plastics recycling. We represent the plastic reclaimers and recyclers, uh, along with uh, everybody else in the value chain, pretty much. Uh, we focus on all aspects of plastics recycling for all kinds of material, and that it means supply, demand, quality, and value. So I'll touch a little bit on each of those topics uh, in terms of flexible film recycling, because it's, it's very complex and um, not easy to get your hands around. Um, design for Recyclability is APR's signature program. Our design guide for plastics recyclability is a handbook that brands and packaging manufacturers use to make sure that the packaging they're putting out in the marketplace can be recycled. And for companies especially that have made sustainability commitments, um, to have recycled material in their packaging and to make sure their packaging is recycled. They understand that plastics packaging literally cannot be sustainable or circular without recycling. So thankfully, there are a lot of really smart people at these companies focusing on design for recyclability. But as Tanya said, in the area of flexible film packaging, um, the very characteristics that make it so good at what it does um, protecting products, showing off products, advertising products, um, being economical to manufacture and ship. Some of these attributes actually interfere with the ability of the package to be recycled. And it's not apparent uh, to the consumer in most cases um, whether something is recyclable or not. So uh, APR is involved um, in just about every aspect of ensuring that flexible packaging is designed to be recycled. So let's talk about collection for a moment. Uh, the, the store drop-off program for flexible film and bags has been around for a long time. Um, it has literally been around for uh, over 30 years, but no one's really paid that much attention to it. It hasn't been on the radar. Sandy. Yes. Okay, we, okay, we lost your sound. Oh, okay. Is it better? Yes. You got it now. Okay, sorry about that. Um, store drop-off for flexible packaging has been around for a long time. Uh, it started with retail bags, uh, but now it is faced with the challenge of accepting these other types of packages, like you see in the photographs um, on my slide. It's never been a program that's been on the radar of public recycling officials. It's been pretty much solely managed by the retailers, and now um, people are focusing on it, and there's this collaboration that all of us are working on to try to improve it and enhance it, because it is the way that recyclers depend on for getting that material that they need. So is, is the drop-off system perfectly healthy? No, um, it definitely needs some improvement, but is it a total failure? No, that's not true either. And some of the, um, I think some of the reports that have come out during the pandemic have made it sound like the whole system is just um, falling apart and uh, it's just not going to be any good and we have to immediately do something else. And, and that is not um, the case. We probably need to transition to some sort of curbside collection, but in the meantime, um, we can all work on improving store drop-off. And as Tanya mentioned too, re retail stores are not recycling centers. They're not MRFs. Um, but they can provide consumers with an important service. And if they can make that service pleasant and easy to use, uh, consumers and customers will appreciate that. And I think that retailers understand that. Um, but again, we need to give them the tools to make it as good as they possibly can. Um, sorting and processing is uh, the next topic. And that's probably the, the second biggest um, technical hurdle for uh, recycling flexible films, the first being designed for recyclability, although you could say they're they're pretty much equal. Um, 
if you look at the two photographs in the middle of my slide, you'll see uh, the, some of the problems with sorting and processing that are illustrated. Um, the, the one slide, uh, the one picture on the left shows what can happen to flexible packaging if it goes into a MRF, uh, tangles everything up, um, it can be dangerous to clean it out. And then the second picture of that bale shows what you might get if you did um, process the variety of flexible packaging in the marketplace through a MRF and came out with a bale. So uh, it's, not, it's not pretty and we, we need to work as an industry on better sortation and recovery systems for this material uh, and to figure out um, where the value is in that bale and how we might develop systems that could sort for value. So in terms of quality, um, when APR talks about quality, we're most interested in the quality of the post-consumer pellet or the product that the recyclers make from that feedstock. So uh, everything that we do in design for recyclability is focused on making sure that the recyclers can offer the highest quality recycled plastic into the marketplace so that they can get um, good customers and reliable customers and good prices and the system is um, sustainable and it keeps going. So that it's always a closed loop, right? So that, that goes right back to um, designing for recyclability. So uh, all of these factors have to work together to ensure that the supply is um, clean enough and acceptable to the recyclers. And the last piece of it is the demand. Um, products made from recycled material need to be on grocery store shelves, they need to be available to businesses, uh, and there needs to be an awareness that they're out there and a willingness to buy them. So I guess to, to circle back to my first topic, design for recyclability, um, we can work as much as we want to on design, we can be very successful on package design, um, but as uh, smart people point out to me all the time, um, if it's, you can spend a lot of time designing for recyclability, but if it's not actually recycled, if there's not a system there to move it through, get it to that end user, uh, put it back out in the marketplace, then all this energy on design um, just uh, really just isn't, um, isn't doing anything. So um, closing the loop uh, is where we really need to go. And um, thank you. Uh, for listening and if you have any questions uh you can contact me thank you thank you sandy that was that was excellent uh our next speaker is sherry uh jackson sherry me one second hello everyone i do tee up my presentation are you all seeing it Yes. 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 See now? Thank you. Yes. yes. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so I'm really pleased to be a part of this uh, really excellent panel of experts on film recycling. Uh, as a little background for everyone, the Flexible Film Recycling Group is a self-funded group of the American Chem Chemistry Council. And listed here are members really committed to the sustainability of polyethylene film packaging. That is our focus, PE packaging. Listed here are objectives in terms of increasing awareness, access to recycling, and expanding in markets. And RAP is our hallmark uh, or signature initiative, I should say. Are you all still seeing my screen? Yes. Oh, yes. for some reason, it's, I'm sorry, folks, it's not showing up for me. Um, sometimes, sometimes there's a little bit of a lag, but we can see it says key objectives. Oh, great. As, as I said, I'm not seeing my, yes. my screen, so apologies for that. That's that's kind of odd. Um, you, you see the second slide. It has not advanced, Sherry. We're still seeing the FFRG. Are you seeing it now? Nope. I don't know what's happening, folks. Sorry about that, but I'm not seeing my slide deck anymore. Um, let's see. Hmm. It's disappeared. 
Uh, Sherry, if you want to give me a second, I'll get your uh, presentation up. This is Lynn, and Thank you. I can and I can show it. Thank you. Um, I'll just say that there's been a number of questions about uh, are the slides advancing, and this primarily related to um, Sandy's presentation. And Sandy had one slide. We asked people to keep this short, so that's why. But now we're going to see. Um, uh, Sherry's and hopefully we'll get to my there it is perfect see it now? okay so I have to I'll get into I'll get into slideshow mode but you can keep talking great uh, so listed listed here are the challenges that we have identified to the major challenges to film recycling so they they focus on access they focus on education and in markets primarily in terms of a public awareness around film recycling, most people don't know what we mean when we say film. And not, and not only that, they don't know that the retail collection infrastructure is the primary means of getting this film recycled. Uh, another challenge, and these are current challenges, I should say, because when our group started several years ago, uh, they were more simplistic. So now we have the challenge of a retail collection declining. You know, as Tanya had mentioned, for the various reasons that retailers are not as um, supportive of the programs, but uh, that is threatening our access to recycled polyethylene film. And then we have the supply demand imbalance and uh, insufficient quality film to support the much needed in markets for this material. Next so, slide. Next slide, please. So to address the major challenges to film recycling, as I said, our, our group has been in existence for a while and it's changed since we developed our, what was called our RAP Recycling Action Program. And this is a national education and outreach program to increase, the, as I said, the recycling of polyethylene film. Listed here are some of our key partners and that list is growing and we're continuing to build out our partnerships around film recycling. We provide our partners with resources, both uh, technical resources, communication resources, best practices on how to best recycle polyethylene film. Uh, so what we're looking to do now is scale uh, our public awareness and outreach and, and engagement in film recycling. Uh, next slide, please. To focus on education and outreach in these areas. Educating consumers to recycle right, uh, recycle now, and recycle right, meaning through retail take back versus uh, curbside because it's not widely available for PE films. Educating businesses and consumers on buying recycled, as Sandy had mentioned, and Tanya as well. It's one thing to collect, it's another thing to, to support in markets for this material to make sure that it is recycled. And then we have to educate at the value chain on the importance of not only the retail collection programs, but support for these much needed programs. And then we are also uh, engaging on special, we're, we're looking to pilot demonstration uh, pilots using the, uh, or engaging the entire polyethylene value chain to what we've talked about, close the loop on film recycling, meaning the collection and also the support for in markets for this material. And then through these pilots, we're looking to scale them to expand, again, the opportunities to really ramp up, not only the collection of the material, but the recycling and in markets of the material to make the system work to its, its optimum degree. Uh, next slide, please. And then finally, this is our call to action. This is what we are encouraging all parts of the value chain to join with us to do, to really make film recycling work and to help it to realize its full potential as a recovery option and to support sustainability for PE film. And uh, I, I will uh, ask all of you to consider being part of this effort. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of great work going on. We need to really do a better job of you know, tying all of this great work together. And so we would like to invite you to be part of the journey with us to increase film recycling. So thank you.
Thank you, Sherry. That was, that was very good. I apologize for the technical little no words. And our next speaker is Aideen Quinn. Aideen? Hello, everyone. Let's see. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. It just needs to be enlarged and it's on its way. Yep. Are you, are you seeing the full screen? Yes, plus the next slide screen. Hmm. Oh, let's see. Maybe I need to swap those. Let's see. Uh, maybe we will just go with this. I don't know why. Um, hey, Dean, do you, this is Lynn. Do you see yeah. that there's uh, under your slide, there's three little dots? There we go. Oh, you don't care okay. about little dots. Okay. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, yeah, very excited to be part of this panel. I'm gonna try to go through these slides pretty quickly because I'm excited for the discussion portion of, of this panel. So EFS Plastics is a post-consumer plastic recycler. We have facilities in Ontario, Canada, and in Pennsylvania. We focus on recycling uh, material generated at MRFs. So today we're buying three through seven plastics, tubs and lids, polypropylene, HDP, and film plastic. If you are a MRF or a municipality and you're not already working with EFS, we are very interested in talking to you. Send us pictures, we'll send you pricing. Uh, yeah, my contact information is at the bottom so we can talk after. Now, when it comes to film, we're buying polyethylene retail film or store take back film, as well as MRF generated film. When we're talking about the store retail film, uh, as others have mentioned, that's material that you gather up at your house, you bring back to a store like a Walmart, Wegmans, Target, you drop off in a bin. The material in the bin is then mixed with film from back of the house operations. So that will be the pallet wrap, uh, poly bags. They end up generating a mostly clear stream of, of film. Um, and yes, on the marketplace, some people call it grade B film. Separately, about half the material we're bringing in is, is MRF film. Now that's film that either communities are actively telling residents, put film into your blue box program. Um, and especially in Canada, that's, that's a system that has worked well for quite a long time. Um, and they'll have things like we see in this picture, a vacuum hood where you can remove film through, uh, yeah, just at the MRF setting. We're also buying, we're also getting film from from MRFs that tell the residents, do not put film in your program, <laughs> and this film still ends up there. Um, so whether they like it or not, MRFs are dealing with film, and uh, yeah, we, we are sourcing that material for some of our end products. Now, if we were to design a system, we would absolutely gear people towards the polyethylene, uh, sorry, the, the retail take-back program or the store take-back program instead of the MRF film. As you see in the picture, as been mentioned before, Film can tangle up in equipment. Um, this is some mechanics that are going to spend a couple of hours removing film from star screens. Uh, it's it's not the most efficient way to do it. So sometimes people are concerned. Oh, what if like a coffee cup ends up in in a bin at at, at Walmart? Is that going to ruin the whole batch? Film uh, collected through that take back program is going to be a heck of a lot cleaner than MRF film. Um, so that's it's always kind of the comparison we're making. One cup of coffee is a lot better than the stuffed animals and wires and stuff, it's gonna end up going through a MRF. Uh, our most challenging contamination today in the inbound is not organics or, or food. It would be the multi-layer films that end up in the film stream, mostly because they look and behave very similar to polyethylene film. They're gonna make it all the way through our process and then uh, deposit their contamination into our final products. Now, on the demand side, uh, we do believe that uh, PCR uh, recycled content minimums are necessary for the sustainability of film recycling. So back in 2019, uh, we joined together with a few other companies and industry associations such as NERC to form the Recycle More Bags Coalition. Check out our website if you have the chance. And we were calling for government legislation and procurement policy to require recycled content in things like garbage bags and grocery bags. So for film recycling today, those are the primary end markets, garbage bags and grocery bags. So we laid out a timeline and uh, minimum thresholds that we thought were conservative and, and achievable by the industry. And um, a few things have happened since then. Uh, 
right before the pandemic got into full gear, uh, plastic bag manufacturers did voluntarily commit to using up to 20% recycled content in grocery bags. So it's a voluntary commitment, but that's still very, very meaningful compared to where things stood a few years ago. I personally know of a few uh, cities and towns in, in Canada that have changed their procurement policy to require uh, PCR in garbage bags. And a few states right now are considering recycled content legislation. Specifically, I'm excited about the New Jersey bill. It's passed the Environment Committee and they would be requiring recycled content in gross and uh, carryout bags and trash bags sold in the state. So I just bring these up because if you are a municipality, uh, I would encourage you to go back to the procurement team and, and see, is there a way that when you're purchasing garbage bags to include recycled content, it's a small thing that, that really allows us to recycle more bags domestically. And also, as we hear of more states considering recycled content legislation, I would ask that they consider not only beverage containers, but things like garbage bags. It's it's maybe not as exciting as, than getting it into a consumer's hand that they're drinking out of, but it, it really is impactful. So um, yeah, I would just encourage all recycled content legislation to consider also including uh, trash bags and, and carry out bags. So yeah, looking forward to any questions. Thank you, AD. That was very good. And we go now to our final panelist, uh, Cherish Miller, no relation, with, I forgot the name of your country, company, forgive me, Cherish. Oh, okay. It's Revolution. Go for it. Okay, thank you. And I'm just going to share my screen. One sec. Okay. Okay, since I was going last, I thought I'll give you a little bit about Revolution for those of you who aren't as familiar, and then just give you a summary of everything that's been talked about in the sense that we touch on almost each aspect that all the presenters um, had touched on. So, hey, Jared, this is Tanya. I don't see your slides. Does anybody else see them? No. Uh, let's try it again. No. Yes. There you go. Got him. Okay. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So Revolution, we manufacture, collect, and recycle film products. And so that's everything from agricultural film that we've been traditionally picking up. And we've talked to many and NERC um, members about doing with them. And it also includes like distribution films. So if you think of like stretch wrap type films, we've been recycling that as well. And from that material, we manufacture film products such as ag plastics, carry out bags that you heard Aideen talk about, trash can liners and construction films. So we kind of hit the gamut of manufacturing, collecting and recycling film. And at the bottom right, you'll see we are actually even recycling gloves. And some of you have heard of our program with Chipotle where we are taking gloves, recycling them and turning them into trash can liners that are used at Chipotle restaurants. So, like I said, you've heard from a lot of amazing speakers who have touched on many aspects of film and the challenges. And because at Revolution, we're in the full circle of doing the manufacturing, recycling, and collection, I thought I would just touch on the key points. I know this is a busy slide, but hopefully it'll all make sense. So, one, we talked about the whole idea of having certification. And that is so important as far as the PCR that's being used in film. So those um, producers that are making products, they need to know where that PCR came from in film products. And so with APR, they've come up with a certification for PCR, which is a very important program. And why we bring this up is it's really important that everyone out there is on equal playing fields and that we're all on the same mission of ensuring when we're saying post-consumer resin, we're recycling film, it's certified. The other aspect is the demand that was touched upon. And it's how do we take this product that we're recycling and turn it into something. You'll hear Steve Alexander often say, if it has nowhere to go, that's really expensive trash. If we're recycling something that doesn't have an in market, 
why are we doing that? And so demand is so important. And the demand champions that not only APR has done, but NERC has done through government demand champions, again, is so important in this whole film recycling manufacturing world. The other part is the consumer education. Like, how do you know what to do with the products that you have once you use them? We hear that um, it was brought up by Lynn in the beginning that people are wondering, what do I do with my film? And so consumer education, like what Sherry touched on, is critical in film recycling, manufacturing, and collection. And then last, um, we're in a unique time and that all of a sudden virgin pricing went up really high. And for a long time, we lived in a world where virgin pricing was low. And so when we talked about, hey, you need to put PCR on these products. Adeem talked about the legislation going on. You got some pushback of, well, wait a minute here, the cost, the difference. We need to treat those different because right now, yes, virgin is high, but that won't be forever. And so we need to treat those different. So again, in summary, it's all about how do we certify the PCR? How do we ensure there's demand? How do we make sure consumers know what to do with this film? And how do we treat PCR different from Virgin? Thank you. Thank you. And if all the panelists want to rejoin us now, we can start on, on uh, our questions. And I've got some questions to start off with, and hopefully I'm gonna be covering some of the questions that. Are, uh, that, that have already been submitted. We have a, a substantial number of questions that it's submitted by the audience. Uh, and hopefully I'm gonna be able to cover some of those in the, in the questions I raise. And excellent, we've got all our panelists now. I, I think I'd like to start off with recycled content. Um, there, there are a lot of questions that have been raised about recycled content. For instance, one questioner asked about the level of recycled content currently in, in uh, bags in general, and I suspect garbage bags in particular. Uh, other questions about uh, this, which, which films are most suitable for recycled content, which less, what are the barriers towards using recycled content? I know that's kind of a broad question, but why don't we just start off with a little discussion on recycled content uh, and, and what you see the biggest barriers uh, to increasing it, and what do you think are the most likely uh, reasons to push forward on getting recycled content for these products more firmly established. Tanya, you want to start with that one? Yeah, and then I think Cherish is, you know, really well suited because she's actually making bags with recycled content. Um, I would say, you know, related to garbage bags and trash bags, a lot of them are not using any recycled content at all. But we also know on the flip side of that, the best can, best in class can be, you know, upwards of 90% recycled content. And so I think the idea that we're putting a virgin plastic bag into the landfill, you know, and not even moving towards recycled content, I think Aideen raised a really critical point of that's something that if you even if you're trying to get rid of plastic in your household, garbage bags are one thing that I think most people are planning on keeping. And so it's a really great end use of recycled content and it matters less because they're not food contact. And a lot of people um, don't really care particularly what they look like. And a lot of garbage bags are already dark in color, meaning that the you know, impurities of, of pellet color don't necessarily come through. And so I think that garbage bags in particular are a really good uh, place to start because a lot of them don't use any recycled content at all or are using just post-industrial scrap and not using post-consumer uh, materials. So I'm gonna kick it to Cherish because I think she's because she's creating bags for California, can really answer that question specifically to carry out bags. Cherish, go for it. Yes, so thank you, Tanya. So definitely in the trash can liners, uh, we often say we put up to 97% because there's colorant and some additives in the film, but we actually do have a trash can liner, sorry, garbage bags <laughs> that some people refer to, uh, they have 100%, and it's a phenomenal way to put PCR into something. And definitely we, have been behind this and this is how we put a lot of the film we've recycled we put it into trash can liners as tanya said we are also doing it in carry out bags um Aideen spoke about the law in california the requirement currently is 40 percent but you can definitely put more than that there's some um, great examples of others in the industry as well that are putting high levels of post-consumer resin um, you can put it back in agricultural film um, industrial film. Um, it, there's definitely ways and um, places to put it. And again, if we want this to be 
recycled, we need to find a home and definitely trash can liners are a wonderful place and then these others that we've mentioned. Do you have a rough idea of what the amount of recycled content is today? Care to, anybody care to guesstimate on that one? It's in the, in the, in the garbage bags in particular? Do you mean on average what people are putting no. in? No, just yeah, just in terms of, of the of the garbage bags that are that are being produced. Does anybody have an idea how, what what the level of recycled content is today? Uh, whether that both post consumer but also perhaps even uh, pre consumer. Is it in a, a substantial amount or is it still a pretty small amount? So I think it's still a pretty small amount compared to other durable items mm -hmm. as far as the you know the market share of in use of of recycled film. Okay. And are there are there any quality problems with that, or or since it's a garbage bag and it's going to be a thicker uh, material anyway, uh, do do you not have quality issues with that particular in market? You actually don't even need to have to be thicker, and some of that is a bit a myth too. You'll see laws that try and put it at like 0.7 mil as the minimum. You can put post consumer um, resin into the thinner trash can liners as well. And that's being done currently, it's just not being you know, done everywhere. Okay, any other thoughts on recycled content? Sandy, uh, Aideen, Sherry? Any, uh, I like certainly have other thoughts if there's other specific questions, but um, yeah, I think Cherish and Tanya summarized it quite well that yeah, there's, there's Compared to the amount of virgin material making it into garbage bags, there's very little post-consumer resin being used today, um, but there's opportunities to use much more. And I, I like to think just of the large scale um, kind of experiment that has happened in California that they have had to use 10% post-consumer in all the trash bags in California. There's some loopholes, but in general, that's the scale that it's happening on since 1994. Um, so if it can happen at that scale for uh, that long, it certainly could be expanded to other places quite easily. Yeah, and Chad, I was going to add to, you know, I think we should also make a distinction between food grade, you know, materials and non-food grade. And, and I think that's a real critical piece here. We're talking about things that never touch food, getting to a PCR level that could be made back into a, you know, a food contact film package is a completely different ball game. And so I think a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is, material going into something that doesn't have to touch food because there's letters of non-objection and food grade PCR is a real challenge for not just film, it's also a challenge for rigids as well. Do you think that's an achievable goal? Yes. I mean, I yeah, I do. You know, I, th I just think it's a much more challenging goal. Okay. Okay. Uh, question for Sandy that, that I'd like to raise and, and everybody else can, can hop in on this one. Uh, are, are there any uh, bags that are particularly challenging or any for recycled content, any end uses beyond the food contact? Um, that's not, it, it's hard to say. Um, the, you know, the quality varies. I think probably Aideen or um, somebody else would be more capable of answering that question than me. Sure. Um, so I think uh, when we're talking about film recycling, certainly the kind of the the easiest application for recycled film would be into a, a plastic lumber. And there's a, a wide range of plastic lumber available. There's some really high high end plastic lumber that's a great application for plastic film. Um, but but certainly when you're compressing film into a lumber type application, you can have all kinds of contaminants. There can be pigment, um, other types of materials and they don't pose as much of a challenge. It's when you put film back into film that you really have to start worrying about quality. And so certainly we're saying that garbage bags are a relatively easy application for film, but still that, that's higher than plastic lumber. Getting film back into a film, you have to go through a very rigorous cleaning process. You have to make sure that there's no impurities in the, in the plastic. So it's still hard to do. Um, and we plan, have plenty of room to grow it in that space. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is certainly an upgrade from something like a plastic lumber. Okay. 
if with uh, no more questions on that, uh, just I've got a quick question for Lynn. Uh, do you want to bring up the Government Recycling Champions program that NERC is doing? Uh, sure, happy to. And I know uh, Cherish brought it up, so thank you, Cherish. Uh, so yes, NERC has a, a voluntary program in partnership with the Association of Plastic Recyclers, parallel to their program they've had for several years that works with the private sector to get the public sector to start buying stuff with post-consumer resin. And it is a free program, it's a recognition program, and it's an incentive program, um, and free technical assistance and all kinds of great things. It's open to public sector entities, as well as public and private educational institutions, as well as state recycling organizations. And um, we, we begin with miraculously lousy timing a week after the pandemic began, it could have done it more brilliantly. So we're off to a little bit of a slow start, but um, would love to talk to people about it. There is a, um, uh, the, a webpage on the NERC home page where you can go and get more details, or you can reach out to me and get additional information. Um, but it's a great program, and many people have touched on the importance of increasing the purchase of products with post-consumer resin uh, and making them. But as was said way at the beginning, if you guys aren't buying it, what for? Um, you know, you have to be buying the stuff and doing it intentionally. So that's my little pitch. If I may, Chaz, there's been a number of questions. I think there's still some fundamental confusion about what is recyclable as a plastic film from a household? Yes. And is there a basic test, like a poke test or an ink test or, you know, all those kinds of things. So if somebody could just really go through some of the basics of what they should and could put in that retail bin, I think it would help. Thanks. And I, I might add, there's also, I think, some confusion from some of the in markets where I've seen some potential bags at one time wanted and, and now no longer wanted. So uh, would, would somebody like to respond to Quint, uh, Len's question? I could do that. Either Tom, yes. you or I can respond. Yeah. I have plastic film at my desk because that's what kind of plastic nerd I am. Um, so um, easy test is it stretches. Like if you push your thumbs through it, uh, polyethylene film will stretch kind of indefinitely. Even a high density film will, will stretch it and it will eventually pop before it tears or anything like that. So put your thumbs in it like this. Everybody can see that and push, right? And it'll stretch. Um, film that tears, like paper, I think you guys can see that slit, usually not polyethylene. So that's what we tell people looking for a number two or a number four for high density or low density polyethylene and then doing the stretch test. Now, there are some items like frozen food bags or salad mix bags that are polyethylene as their base resin, but they have additives in them that are not recyclable because of the additives. And I think Adine and Cherish can talk a little bit more about that if we really wanna go into the technical details of that. But typically, if it's stretchy, it can go in the bin. Sherry, do and you wanna add, add anything? Add, yeah, just to identify more generally, and these are the products that the major recycler has said is compatible in the stream. So you have your uh, overwrap for you know paper towels and bathroom tissue, and you have your, your wrap over cases of soda and, and various other bulk products. You also have dry cleaning bags, you have uh, shipping pillows and bubble wrap and uh, a whole host of things, uh, uh, bread bags and potato bags. And for those that have food in them or food contact, if they're clean and dry when you put them in the stream, i.e. if you shake all the breadcrumbs out, it's, very, it's perfectly compatible in the stream. But you know, those images we showed at the beginning of our presentation, I think Tanya had some and I had some, are the common items that are accepted in that stream right now, I understand from the reclaimer, rather indefinitely. Okay. Yeah, and I was, plastic film, and I was gonna say, maybe put plasticfilmrecycling.org in the chat. That's a great place to go and see yeah. exactly what we're talking about. So that's our resource website, plasticfilmrecycling.org. I want to make one more point that compostable does not mean recyclable because this yeah. is a, a film that's compostable supposedly with cutlery in it and it's not stretchy at all. It's crinkly and it tears really easily, but people sometimes confuse compostable and recyclable. So this is not recyclable. You could toss in your compost bin and see what happens. 
But you, you will also see not only the things that are recyclable, but that are not compatible in that stream listed on plasticfilmrecycling.org. We had a lot of questions about chemical recycling, advanced recycling, uh, <laughs> how that fits in with film recycling, whether it's, it's perhaps the best process, creates the best in markets, or, or just how it, how it fits in. Uh, I know this is something of a hot potato in a way, but it's there, and I think we need to address it. Uh, and certainly, like I said, we've had a, we've had a bunch of questions about it. So uh, start just with the, with the panelists in, in terms of chemical recycling. How does it fit in to recycling of, of film plastics? Anybody well, I'll want start to off. I'll oh. start off, of course, um, with the ACC, and of course, we have a whole team of people dedicated to. Uh, advanced chemical recycling, but it's really important for difficult to recycle films. So the food grade films, that process will enable those films to be recovered through uh, advanced recycling. In addition to the more difficult multi-laminates we were talking about or multi-layer films, that process can also uh, be used to re recover those films as well and put them in suitable end uses. So it's, it's very valuable for that, the things that cannot be mechanically recycled or are more difficult to process. Uh, chemical recycling has a lot, or advanced recycling has a lot of potential to support recovery of those uh, products. Any other comments? Sherry, Tanya? So I think uh, chemical recycling is, is very exciting and uh, we're absolutely keeping our eye on what's happening there. It definitely will play, play a role in the future. It's important to note though that there currently are no large scale buyers of film who are using chemical recycling to process that material, um, nor much other post-consumer plastic in general. So although it has a lot of potential, it's not happening today. And I think some of the obstacles to getting it to full scale operation are that what's coming in a post-consumer stream is not a single resin. It's especially when we're buying MRF film, there is a lot of extra stuff in there. Um, and you do need some type of mechanical sortation before you can actually chemically react certain uh, polymers to make a very specific monomer product. So um, I think there's a lot of potential, but it's certainly not a silver bullet. Um, and I think most people understand that. So, right, Dean, you're essentially saying the mechanical processing is inevitable even for chemical recycling, at least at yeah, this some point. some type of pre-processing. If, if it's coming from a consumer, and I, I as good as, as Tanya said, some people can be once they really understand the messaging on what they can put in. I mean, I'm working with some communities in Canada who have been recycling film for the last 15 years. And the more eager people are to recycle the right thing, the more wish cycling you're going to see. So, you know, I pulled some bags off the line the other day and it was recycled is people in their households who had collected all the film that they encountered and they really thought they were doing the right thing with it but most of what was in that bag was multi-layer films and that needs to be removed if you're if you're going to do um you know depending on the process you'll have to do some type of mechanical sortation first yeah, and I'll add to that. I've done, you know, a bag sort at grocery stores, and sometimes you find that, you know, the flyers, the paper flyers that obviously the consumer didn't put in the bin that came from somebody probably switching those out that they saw a recycling bin, they put them in. So, you know, even, not unrelated to films, there's also always going to be other materials that in sandy wipes and all sorts of things that are at the front of the grocery store that people put in the bin because it's a receptacle of some sort. So all of that stuff has to be managed somehow you know, coming out of the stream, even if the consumer is doing a really good job. Okay, and thank you. Know, you. It's, it's it. interesting because it's how you're designing too, right? There's a designing for recyclability that's talked a lot about by APR and, you know, that's a subject of the U.S. Plastics Pact. And so it's designing for this type of recycling, the mechanical recycling. And as Dean said, and Tanya said, there is that place of maybe those products that can't be but the mechanical, the whole designing for that and understanding that is um, what's critical as well too, right? And as there's a, a push on the infrastructure to build the infrastructure to allow for the recycling, I just feel like, again, not saying that chemical recycling doesn't have its place, but there's still this place for the mechanical too in design and people understand. 
Yeah, both her and great points, and they're both, but I have to emphasize, they're both meant to complement, well, chemical recycling advance is meant to complement mechanical recycling. Yeah, you can't use the promise of chemical recycling to forget about designing for recyclability. They go, at some point, we can just throw it all in one big pot, and it'll come out as some wonderful chemical. And yeah, there's a little more to it than that. So Cherish, you're absolutely right. Thank you. We need them both. Excellent point, Sandy. In some ways, I've been waiting for that one easy pot for 50 years now. <laughs> yeah, you and me too, Jess. <laughs> I've got that. I mean, you would have already it. done it. <laughs> I, I want to totally and bring up something that I believe one of you referred to earlier, but uh, a couple of questions about it also. And that's the impact of the price of oil on the price of recycling virgin resin versus, versus uh, recycled resin. I mean, I've noticed even in the limited amount of car driving I'm doing these days, price of gas is going up, and actually fairly substantially over the last six months. Uh, has that had an impact uh, at all favorable on the pricing when you compare virgin versus plastic pellets? Anybody wish to jump in on that, or do I have to pick somebody? Cherish? Yeah. So, well, maybe I'll take it first. Um, the so we directly see that we're we're our com competition is with the virgin plastic and uh today yeah virgin plastic pricing has peaked for polyethylene and polypropylene it the last last few months it's really skyrocketed and i think it's really interesting when it comes to something like trash bags a year ago today certainly polyethylene pricing was very low. It was very difficult for recycled content to compete with that very low pricing. Today, as a re recycler, you know, we're sold out this month because suddenly our costs are well below the, the cost to recycle virgin. It proves to me that our material is, is easily usable by these processes. Uh, it's just a matter of pricing. And the peak that we're seeing right now that's not predicted to stick around for the next few years. It, it is kind of seen as, as a blip. Um, there's more virgin plastic predicted to be produced over the next 10 years. We will see prices stabilizing and go back down. Um, so certainly this is good for right now, but we do need to be thinking about a year from now, we're gonna be back in that situation where recyclers are competing with the virgin plastic pricing. And, and it, it is a, a very difficult competition for a small scale recycler to be competing against Exxon. <laughs> uh, Cherish or anybody else, Tanya, want to add to this? It, it's, you know, it goes back to that commitment on the post consumer resin and understanding you, if you treat it exactly like Virgin, then you're going to, we're going to run into this price thing. It's just going to be all about price with what Dean just said. So it's treating it it different and having a commitment to that PCR is, is really what's needed. So you're I'll tell you something I'd be really interested in. Um, and the other day I, I was at like three different stores um, just shopping for stuff. And I went to the trash bag aisle in each store. And I think one was like a big box, might've been Home Depot, another was grocery. And I looked for trash bags that said on the box that they had recycled content in them. And it was very hard to find them. And I just wonder, you know, we can talk about price and competing with Virgin, and I understand that's all real and true, but you know, what if 70% of the boxes on that shelf said right on it, you know, this is made of recycled material. Um, you can help the environment by buying this box of trash bags. I would, and I know people that would, they might, okay, maybe it's 50 cents more a box or whatever, but you know, we don't even know what consumers threshold of pain is for that because you can't find the darn thing. So um, I'd like to, um, you know, we're, we're thinking at APR of issuing some sort of a trash bag challenge through our demand champions program, where we could um, just challenge companies to take that step and not be afraid to tell consumers that their product has recycled content in it, because that's a good thing. So I just um, wanted to get that in chest, sorry. Okay, no. I and actually cherish something you said made me think that there's sort of a carrot and stick here that 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 high virgin pellet prices are a great carrot, but you also need the stick of, of recycled content requirements. 
but you, you really can't rely on one or the other. It, 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 it really, they both have a part to play, uh, which may be some solace the next time I go fill up my car and I pay more for gas. I'll be thinking of, of all those, those better prices for recycling. A uh, bunch of questions about the impact of the pandemic on film recycling. And I want to start off with one that there was, there was simply, because of the pandemic, a lot of plastic film uh, drop-offs places seem to have gone out of business, just simply shut down. Uh, not to mention the increased number of plastic bags because of the whole temporary ban on silliest thing I've seen in years on reusable bags. Uh, how do you think we can spring back from this, this closure of the of the film uh, recycling and, and, and the, the, the smaller number? Is there is there a what part does industry have to play? What part can state or local governments play in that? Uh, Sandy, you want to start that one? Yeah, that was an interesting situation. And, um, you know, California particularly suffered uh, with a lot of bins being pulled and this whole panic about um, reusable bags maybe being contagious or, or something. But in the, in, the, in the southeast where I live, um, thankfully, it was not nearly that severe. Um, you know, some, some big chains, I guess corporate told them to pull their bins and they did, but um, they've come back um, fairly soon, you know, sooner than you might have expected. And some chains, like our local PetSmart has actually added um, capacity, which they never had a bin before. Um, but really, I think Cherish is probably the expert on that because she is in California and saw firsthand what happened with the pandemic. So maybe Cherish, you could share your thoughts. Consider that a lateral pass, Sherry. It's all yours. <laughs> Did she say Sherry or Cherish? Cherish. But we'll let you uh, join too. I, yeah, I'm happy to because um, we live and breathe this stuff. And uh, what we found is it was inconsistency. I mean, there's some cases where you did see bins pulled out of concern for safety of workers. And then there's some, particularly like in my area, where the programs work seamlessly. There were no changes. So I think things have calmed down now. And you and Tanya can definitely speak to uh, the specifics. But uh, a number of those major chains that pulled the bins have restored them in a lot of cases. Uh, but it gets back to one of the things we were talking about earlier, where retailers need to understand, and we're working uh, with SPC and APR and others to help with this, the value of the, those programs to their customers for recycling and the value of those programs to their own sustainability goals and objectives. So once we do more to, to enhance that, I don't think they'll be as subject to switching in and switching out as quickly because once they, when they began early on, they had a different uh, value to retailers than they do now. So that's why I said early on in education, not only do we need to be educating consumers, we need to be educating the value chain on what are some of the critical issues here that they need to be aware of to better support the, these programs. Okay, uh, Cherish, you want to add something? I mean, really, we, we did have a suspension on the SB 270 for a period of time that the governor put in place, which was the reusable bag um, requirement and allowed single-use bags to be given out at stores um, at the time. It's gone, as people have all said. Um, really, you know, it's the understanding of that reusable bags could still be used. You may have to have to pack them yourself and things like that, but that was just the difference of you know, that switch and, and people just, you know, concern for their health and all that and maybe feeling like if they touched it. But again, it's been back to, you can pack it yourself, you can bring those bags in. And in many cases, like I said, you just leave them in your cart and, and can do it yourself if the packer is not comfortable doing it for you. So I think we've gotten through that. Um, would this panel agree in general that we've gotten through that at this point? And, and, but there was one question that, that is there a place for state or local governments to, to uh, find ways to encourage stores to have take back opportunities for, for film in particular? Uh, and that has come up from a number of, 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 of people with the question raised. So Tanya, what is your thought on that? 
Um, well, and I'll let Cherish answer this when I get done, but, you know, in California, they used to have a, a law in place that mandated stores that gave out bags, um, you know, that they had to have a, a film collection. And um, that was allowed to sunset at the beginning of last year. And so I don't under, I don't know exactly, you know, kind of why that wasn't picked back up uh, for the other film materials when they put in the bag ban more generally. But New York and Delaware both have state mandates that film recycling um, is required at uh, retailers across the state of a certain size. It's, um, I, I don't even want to, it has something to do with square footage and then the size of your chain and the certain number of stores and that sort of thing. But most stores of a chain that are, I think, 5,000 square feet or larger that collect um, state tax or sales tax in New York are required by law to have bins. And so I've actually been working really closely with New York DEC sending them the input that we get from consumers about stores in that state. And so I do think that there's a real opportunity for states, if they're really interested in having this, have an outlet, knowing that we've got markets. But I think there's this other piece of, we don't want to saturate the markets with too much material when we don't have demand that's being grown at the same time. And so I think there's a real opportunity to encourage at the state and local level um, retailers to understand the role that they play here. But um, but I also think that state mandates that require foam recycling are probably not bad, knowing that we've got markets that are looking for material. And then, you know, concurrently with the recycled content mandate, making sure that you're closing that loop to say that we need to create more demand. Thanks, Andy. I got a thumbs up. <laughs> you know, Tanya, solutions. Oh, sorry, I was going to say the solution. The retailer we would hear is. I need anything to recycle that will recycle it, right? And so that's where that demand comes in for the retailers to have the bins and the things for consumers, and then a recycler to know if I take that product and recycle it, that I have an in market. Um, so it just helps everyone. Okay. Uh, we've had some questions about this, and you also read this a lot in discussions about plastic recycling in general, about projected increases, big increases in production capacity to make uh, the feedstocks, polyethylene feedstocks and, and, and other resins. At the same time, there seem to be a number of projects to do just that that have been canceled. Uh, what is your reaction on this? Because I've seen a number of cancellations publicly noticed. Are we indeed looking at a tremendous expansion in virgin capacity to make uh, plastics or is that being tempered by ongoing market realities and the fact that there may be too much capacity out there as we speak? Uh, anybody want to answer that one? I'll start with Tanya then. <laughs> uh, thanks, Chaz. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think that there's this real ebb and flow. I would say, generally speaking, uh, the plastics industry really has suffers from the tragedy of the common if they think that they've got an opportunity to to insert their virgin into the marketplace they'll do it even though that there might be a saturation so i do believe that we're going to see a continued growth in use of plastics and not just film but plastics across the board i think it's not necessarily going to be sensical i think that we've seen that in the past that it doesn't necessarily to make you know make sense to bring things online when they come online but ultimately they come in and then we see the shift in pricing and all that sort of stuff so um I do think based on some projections that we've seen from the folks at IHS market, who I would send that question to if they were here, um, I really do think that we're going to see a growth in plastic over the next couple of decades. And um, I think we're going to really need all hands on deck, whether it be chemical advanced recycling or mechanical or infrastructure for collection and sortation and market demand. We're going to really need a, a real upping of, of the infrastructure and the processes to collect and sort and process this stuff uh, to really keep keep abreast of it. You know, your, your comment about the, cra the, the tragedy of the commons is, is certainly on point. There does seem to be a one, one company says we're going to expand production, so a whole bunch of others decide they have to also. But I do find it intriguing that we have been seeing hearing notices, cancellations of, of proposed projects, that there, there may be uh, an understanding that the growth of plastics is not, in fact, infinite but has its own set of limits and, and that uh, if you can't raise the money to build a, a new plant, you can't raise the money. There may also be some pushback at that end. And I think it'll be interesting to see how that how that plays out over the next couple of years. Uh, any other thoughts on that from any of the panelists? 
by Dean? I just I haven't seen that many cancellations. I there's a there's a lot of projects planned, and I have seen some delays. Um, but I think based on the you know before the pandemic, there was the the whole movement uh, with the children marching against the, the climate change, and um, there did seem to be like a, a public movement about uh, reducing our reliance on carbon and reducing plastics. But at the same time, that's when all of these projects were planned. And I just, I don't see any major shift there despite the pub public interest in, in slowing these projects down. So yeah, I don't, I don't think it's slowing down at all. Okay. Uh, we've had a number of questions about education and contaminants. Uh, food in plastic bags is that how big a problem is that what are the worst contaminants uh for uh, for, for these programs uh and and then the obvious follow-up question that, that these these people are also our, our audience is also raising what are the best education programs on eliminating contaminants from the film collection programs uh anybody like to bite on that can i start with you sherry that would be wrap <laughs> That's what we do. <laughs> no, uh, but on all seriousness, that, that is what we do. Uh, in terms of contaminants, uh, the major contaminants are um, non-polyethylene film in, that ends up in the stream. Uh, we, in places where we have launch campaigns and educate on what I talked about as recycle right, where you, you bring it back, these various film products that we talked about, packaging to the store, clean and dry, uh, and you synced up that messaging with community outreach in addition to outreach from the stores. We have you know, really been effective in not putting it in the MRFs that don't want them. We have been effective in reducing the contamination. So there needs, I think the key is to, to sync up the messaging around what goes in the bin, what's acceptable and what's not to avoid the contamination. And that those are the resources and, and best practices we've developed to help with that. Any other thoughts about education and, and, and contaminants that you really want to avoid? Aideen, I know as a buyer, you've got your own contaminant devils. Yeah, I mean, so every facility has its own uh, preferences, and so for if for us, the multi-material films is definitely the biggest challenge. But for others, it could be organics. Uh, we have a full wash process uh, where other film recyclers might not be washing the material. So for them, it might be very important that there not be any organics. Um, so when I've worked with uh, communities who are putting messaging out to the public about which materials to put into their recycling bins. Uh, we've really pared down the message. We've really made it very, very simple. Like we'll call out categories like we want grocery bags, bread bags, laundry bags, newspaper bags. In Canada, we want milk bags. <laughs> um, and, and really just list like five items and try to reduce people being creative because otherwise people will think they're cheese wrappers and uh, you know other materials they find around the house would would be recyclable when when they aren't. Yeah, and I'll add I've done some of the bag audits for wrap in the past, and I very rarely ever saw anything that had food. And I think it's because people store this in their kitchen or somewhere in their household. And, and then it, it takes them a while to get enough that they're ready to take them back to the grocery store. So I think consumers in general, they're much more likely to put in the wrong kind of film than it is to be something that's really going to have a lot of organics. Like you don't see a half a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in a Ziploc. And you very rarely even see breadcrumbs in the bread bag. You know, they're, they're taking the time to shake them out or to shake out the cereal bag or whatever. And then the other piece, you know, related to the wrap campaigns that we've done is just, you know, in what Edine has said too, multiple like mess, you know, the same message coming from multiple sources. It's on the news, it's on Facebook, your community groups are saying it, the grocery store is saying it, your recycling coordinator is saying it. The more times people hear this, the much more likely they are to actually get it. So Chaz, this is, let me interrupt for, so what about labels? So labels on stuff, do you care? What should I do with labels? 
Which is a great question because we had one specifically about paper labels. So thank you, Lynn. That was great. Cherish and Nadine, you want to add that? You want to answer that one? So I think that would be that's more of a question for when you're designing something. Yeah, we would prefer that the films aren't designed with paper labels. Um, for our process, if you know 98% of the bale is film that doesn't have labels and maybe 2% has a you know a paper shipping label, absolutely not a problem for our process. But the more mixed materials you have in a bale, the fewer end markets you will have. So, but I would I would put punt that problem back to the designer. I would like to see the film designed with less paper attached to it. But at the consumer level, that shouldn't be something that prevents you from recycling. Uh, it is a complicated question, though. <laughs> yeah, we would agree with that. Same, same. It'd be better not to. Um, but at the same time, there has been some strides, and I know you know it's still in infancy, but to make labels that can be recyclable. Sandy could speak to that from the APR perspective, where if you want to, Sandy, talk to that some of the label advancements. Sure. Um, generally, um, for film packaging, labels aren't as popular as they are for bottles because you can print on the entire surface of the package. So what APR is doing in terms of our design for recyclability and our test protocols, we're soon going to have a working group looking at different inks and pigments and printing technologies to make sure that that material doesn't uh, become a contaminant in the recycling process. Um, we have one company that has received recognition from APR for a polyethylene or polypropylene label as an alternative to a paper label. And that's better than paper, definitely. Um, but the adhesive also will have some impact. So um, Aideen, um, somebody like Aideen's company with the washing system, Again, they may be able to wash off that adhesive and that label. Other companies may not be able to. So um, it's preferable not to have a label. And if there's going to be one, it should be a plastic label. And I think that's the way the marketplace is going. Maybe I would just say in there, yeah, for, for our process, a polypropylene label would probably be worse than a paper label. Everyone's process is different. So I wouldn't say just a plastic label it would have to be a polyethylene label. We've also had some interesting questions about other specific contaminants, food inside the, the, the bag. Uh, what about uh, plastic bags inside cereal boxes? Are those recyclable? Yes. Yes. A polyethylene film. And so they're recyclable. And what about the, the food? Again, shake it out. Just shake out any of the remnants and it's fine. I mean, if it has like a big pot peanut butter schmear, don't don't recycle that. I mean, you know, I think I think this is a place where we can expect consumers to have a, you know, the ability to have yeah. a little, you know, yeah. um, understanding of, you know, it needs to be clean and dry. And so a bag that held a sandwich is fine. If it still has half the sandwich, please don't recycle it. Hmm. Which interestingly, when, when newspaper recycling really started, it had to be clean and dry. And as time went on uh, and as the demand increased, the technology increased dramatically, so that what at one time was was forbidden, technology is taken care of. The most obvious example right now are pizza boxes, uh, which everybody at one time thought were one of the evil sins of recycling, and now, as long as you don't have an uneaten pizza inside the box, uh, it's not it's not nearly the problem it used to be. You know, just simply much better uh, technologies, cleanup technologies. And, processing technologies. So I, I guess the question I have is, is over the next two to three years, uh, and I want to ask this of, of each one of you, do you see any particular advancements in the processing technology itself that will help eliminate some of these relatively common contaminants? Uh, anybody want to jump at that first? Well, I think the most promising thing that will probably happen in the next few years is again happening upstream, and that is a techno technological upgrade. Um, a lot of manufacturers are looking to design uh, stand-up pouches that are polyethylene, are primarily polyethylene. 
And so switching from a multi-material stand-up pouch to a polyethylene stand-up pouch. And as long as the, the whole marketplace makes that shift, then suddenly that's something that we could start including in our, uh, in our uh, literature out to the public that yes, now it's time to, if it looks like a stand-up pouch, that's probably something we want. But today there's you know, too right. many formats, so we would not recommend that. Um, but that's kind of what I see changing. It will take a lot of people working together to get to that, uh, you know, holy land. But uh, that's that's what I see as most promising for really uh, reducing the problems we're having now with the multi-material films. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to jump on that, Cherish? I think, um, and definitely, Ad made a really good point. That's that's a big one with so many people moving to pouches, the mono layer. Um, you know, we've been recycling agricultural film for many years with a lot of contaminants in it, um, and so the food and things like that, like you said, prefer not. But what Ad said, definitely spot on. And what I feel like with the demand and the driving towards this content requirements we'll figure out ways to solve these challenges like we figured out ways to solve what we have so far right it's finding that demand and saying okay there is a demand for this material we we need to figure it out the sortation um, many things are going in that are advancing have helped us so i hope that makes sense it's truly just driving that demand that helps us solve the issues I also had a number of questions about the ziplocs on on uh, the receivable bags are those a problem? I'm, no. getting, I'm getting nods of no, so those aren't a problem. I understand there's a new technology with more of a Velcro type of, of closure. Is that going to be a problem, or has that been taken care of in the, in, in the uh, uh, process of, 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 of developing it? Does anybody know? I, I think that that's much more likely to be a bigger problem because it's a bigger it's a bigger piece of the whole. You know that little zipper at the top of the Ziploc bag is tiny. The the Velcro is on both sides of the closure and it goes the whole length and it's usually you know like a half an inch wide. And compared to the whole weight of the pack of the pouch, especially if it's not polyethylene that can be pulled in, it's not just, it's not dissimilar from a, a cap on a bottle, but the cap is really enormous and the bottle is really small. You've got to talk about the percentage of the whole. So I think it's much more likely to be a problem, but I'm not saying that it is because I don't know if it's polyethylene or not. If that's not a polyethylene Velcro, it, it could be much more of a, an issue if it comes into broader use. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sandy. One of the things we hear a lot at APR is about polypropylene films. Apparently polypropylene films are used um, at high volumes in Europe. And we always get asked, well, why can't we recycle polypropylene films in North America? We, we, we're a global brand company. We wanna use that material here. And we have to tell them it is not recyclable in, the, in North America right now. A polypropylene film just isn't. And because the grocery stores can't sort it and there's no other sortation that takes place, and because you can't mix them together, like Aideen said, the polypropylene is a contaminant to polyethylene. But some people don't want to hear that. Um, but unfortunately, right now it's true. And we, we sort of have a rule of thumb at APR where we say, if you want to recycle it, we need about a 300 million pound a year um, generation to build a facility to handle it. And then you still need to sort it out and get it to yourself. So it's we, we do hear this at, at APR, you know, well, why can't I do this? And why isn't this material um, recyclable? But for now, we we just need to beef up the um, mono polyethylene film stream. And there's a lot of smart people out there, a lot of good packaging engineers that can make that happen. So um, this is Lynn. Uh, I need to interrupt everybody. Fabulous job, very exciting information. You guys are not going to believe how many questions you are going to be sent. <laughs> I can believe that I've seen all of them. A very engaged audience. So thank you uh, to to everybody that spoke and to the pan to the audience as well. Just really quickly, NERC has a conference coming up March 30th and 31st. I hope you'll all plan on joining us. And we have uh, some upcoming webinars. March 25th, uh, changes to the model legislation for toxins and packaging, which includes PFAS and other plastic uh, contaminants. And we have two two webinars coming up in May about lithi lithium battery management and recycling, um, all of which are uh, viewable on the NERC 
homepage. And with that, I am going to thank Chaz and Sherry, Cherish, Aideen, Sandy, Tanya, great group of people and knowledge, and so appreciate it. And we'll look forward to the next time. So thanks, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye now.